Hey, hello everybody. This is uh, this chapters are going to be nine and ten. So we're going to focus on political economies and also a little bit about uh, inequality in the chapter ten. So we've kind of gone over some of the economic models that exist in the U.S. Where whether it's a pure market economy, which is there really really no pure uh, market economy in the world, um, or a command economy, which there are very few, and um, most economies are kind of mixed, and I think we'll use the United States as a good example of a, a mixed economy. And, you know, that involves something with um, where we have a, a system of capitalism that's influenced by the government, in a sense. So the government sets up things, and this is kind of where people get into maybe an ideological discussion, is how much should the government be involved in business? Um should a government uh, regulate and protect the consumers and maybe employees? Uh, that's where we kind of have a differencing of opinion throughout our country. Um, so when you look at this and you kind of see, um, you know, the whole system of our economy is based off of selling uh, goods and services. Um, and it's a cyclical nature. Um, and in some instances, people bar uh, barter. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's something that we don't really do that much here anymore. Um, our country is measured off of GDP as far as performance. Uh, the G D GDP, the gross domestic product, there's the formula. You're not going to need to know the, the formula to calculate anything, just in generally what a GDP is, uh, gross domestic product here in the United States. Um, the, uh, it, our GDP per capita is about $55,000 per people. And when we talk about how wealth is produced, you know, it kind of comes from industrialization and the inventions of technologies. CIA handbook, if you look at this link, um, it'll show you uh, throughout the countries in the world and who has the highest GDP and who has the lowest GDP. We talked about industrialization and we talked about inequality. Inequality is the gap between the rich and the poor here in the United States and throughout the world. As you can see with this uh, this graph here, the United States is comparable to countries like China, Iran, uh, Mexico as far as inequality or the, the difference between the rich and the poor, which is measured by something called the Gini Index. And here it's also called the Gini coefficient, another term for it. So the higher uh, the the Gini coefficient is, the more inequality there is in, in our country. And here is another graph, I mean another uh, um, website that shows uh, the Gini coefficient for um, other countries throughout the world and, and how that's measured Um so I talked about market economy, capitalism, where people, you know, you kind of issue something called a price point when you supply meets demand. When supply meets demand, that means uh, that's the point that the price you're going to charge. So the higher supply, lower demand means you're going to expect lower prices. The higher demand, uh, lower supply, you're going to see, in a sense, a, a higher um, uh, price point. So we saw a command economy where the government determines what economics produce. This is communism or socialism. People don't own property. Everything's owned by the government. Um, you know, it could be called socialist, Soviet Union, Chinese, China. Um, you know, we look at, go through the slides here, and it talks about pure command economies. Um, China is has been incorporating market economy reforms in the 80s. And North Korea is a pure command economy. Now, when we talk about differences of of uh, market economies, uh, most economies are mixed. And like we said, what's the government's responsibility? Is it to uh, provide protections? So, I mean, in a sense, if you buy something, should you be protected? Those are kind of questions that come out of how much involvement should the government have in our economy? And here's some examples that we go through a little bit more in market economy. And it talks about, the book also talks about Germany. 
and how the social welfare state is bigger in Germany than the U.S. Uh, free university education, public transportation, taxes are higher, um, and slightly more aggressive than in the United States. Um, it's harder to get, uh, you know, Ger uh, in Germany, unions are very strong. Uh, they're not so much as strong as they used to be here in the U.S., um, but uh, the U.S. membership in, in unions has gone down to about 13% of the working population. Financial markets. And Germany is a very good you know, illustration. The book also, also talks about Malaysia. And some of the things that come out of that. So here is a, a, a kind of a graph that shows you um, what is expected out of the economy of these three countries. And, you know, kind of goes back to kind of reflections of what uh, people feel as far as, um, uh, you know, capitalism is capitalization, capitalism and exploitation of workers, kind of the criticisms that Marx came, um, and, you know, some of the things that, that we have traditionally heard about, the, the concepts of market economies and its negativities that associated um, with it. Um, environmentalism uh, uh, complained that capitalism can lead to environmental devastation. Fascism in its relation and Islamism in its relation. And some more graphs that I want you guys to take a look at. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at chapter 10. Talk about development and growth. Okay, so um, economic growth in the U.S. is about 2.9%. That means our economy grows about 2.9% each uh, year. We have to you know, definitely control stuff for inflation and unemployment, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When you have economic growth, people are happier. We buy more. We buy more personal property, which is a sign of of the economy doing well, you have extra money to spend or something called disposable income is the money you have after all your bills are paid, the money you have left over for the movies, to go out, to do a date night, stuff like that. Um, you know, when we talk about developing an area and, you know, economic growth happens in underdeveloped countries um, as a way to try to stimulate growth. So if we are, I mean, you know, you've been to downtown San Diego, that's a good example of a redevelopment, uh, developed area where prior to the, to the construction of Petco Park um, and some of the bars that were placed into the gas lamp quarter, it uh, wasn't necessarily a desirable area to go to prior to maybe 1998, 99, um, probably before a lot of you were born, uh, but you know, since the redevelopment projects that happened there, it kind of led to um, a, a economic boom in that area. But, you know, on the other hand, it affected, uh, you know, maybe sprawl, which means more people moved in, which in a sense might have pushed out the homeless. And, you know, it leads to NIMBYs, which is not in my backyard, or people that don't want developed areas or don't want redevelopment to happen in their area because of sprawl and pollution. Also talk about uh, economic growth, the Human Development Index, which is uh, which is measured by the UN's um, formula here. And if you look at it, uh, shows the more developed countries, the higher the coefficient here, um, the better developed countries you have. And you know, you take into account stuff like life expectancy at birth, how long a baby, um, I mean, the infant mortality rate of a of a country, you know, in compare and contrast with schools and, and per capita income and uh, how many years people go to school and, and how much income you earn as a result of that um, shows, you know, the more developed countries. And we saw at the top, um, we look at the bottom here, uh, as we go down, we start seeing the low countries that aren't as developed. And some of them, a lot of them are African countries, Middle Eastern countries. And if we look at the top two, you can get some instances of, of um, 
the most developed country. I think the Scandinavian countries were on the list. Uh, yeah, Norway. And the United States is number 13 as far as development. Um, when we talk about stability in an economy, there has to be political and legal stability. We have to have a rule of law. We have to have systems in place to protect consumers and protect employees. Um, you have to have clear property rights, and this includes intellectual property, right? So if you invent something, that needs to be respected. If you invent something, and that is something that is um, uh, <clears throat> patented, then no one else can use it without your your permission. Um, governments can provide infrastructure such as bridges, roads, schools. Um, money has to be sound. Our dollar has to be worth the dollar. Um, if our dollar is is one day worth one dollar and goes down to seventy five cents, that's not a good thing. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And there's some uh, elements here that are measured in this table. And explains a little bit more of that. Okay, now when we talk about unemployment, unemployment is kind of a vicious cycle. You know, there's kind of a, a, a thing that I think people miss in some instances is the concept of underemployment, where people who uh, are able to work full time they they may not be able to because of their employer not offering forty hours a week. So I think that's something that should be taken into consideration as well. Fiscal policies, which are the policies of government's budgets. Uh, monetary policy, which is you know handled a lot here, here in the executive branch and through the Fed. There are policies that affect the ability to move money, like when central banks raise or lower interest rates that it charges to private banks. And the book talks a little bit about interest rates, um, the rates that... Um, Banks will put on loans um, uh, in order for people to pay back so the banks can make money. Um, if unemployment rises, the bank can stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates, which may cause people to buy stuff more, especially big ticket items like homes or boats or, or things that uh, have a, a kind of a way to stimulate the economy. Uh, we also have inflation which is, um, you know, the increase in prices and the fall in the value, uh, the fall in the value of money. Um, hyperinflation, which is money that is unusual, that actually happened in Mexico maybe about 20 years ago, where we have high inflation and high unemployment. That's not good. Our current inflation rate is 1.9 percent, which is generally very good. Uh, growth can cause economies to overheat, so in a sense, uh, one uh, response is to take money out of the economy, uh, take the lesser amount, I mean, take bills out of circulation, which will increase the value of money. And also austerity uh, policies that are kind of charitable policies that um, aim to reduce government budget deficits through uh, spending cuts, tax increases, or combinations of both. You have something called the Phillips curve here in um, uh, our class. In you know what the Phillips curve measures is, it shows the inverse relationship between unemployment and um, the rate of inflation. So if we have a high unemployment rate and a high inflation rate, that's not good. If we have low unemployment. I mean, excuse me, low inflation, high unemployment, that is a recession. High inflation, low unemployment, that's in the inflationary gap. I also talk about rent and rent seeking and stagnation. Uh, people will seek anti competitive advantages. Rent, any payment not related to productive process. So a lot of what companies can operate off of subsidies, tax breaks, or special contracts. Workers will receive extra benefits through unionization, and the government rents for special interests that we've kind of talked about. And a little bit more here about um, some of the things that come out of rent-seeking and stagnation. And one of the classic responses to this is to encourage competition by liberalizing policies that 
encourage market competition in an economy, maybe taking away some type of pollution laws or, or some type of maybe sur worker protection laws that might give employers more money to spend as far as advancements of technology, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Another act is privatization, um, you know, kind of outsourcing, I guess, is a good term. Uh, I used to work for the county of San Diego, and our IT division was actually privatized, or it was outsourced. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, county workers that did a lot of our, our, our IT stuff for the computers, but a company called uh, Hewlett Packard that, um, in a sense, got a contract from the government to help provide a service that they believe the government believe would be cheaper than if they did it themselves. We also have some competition policies. The Federal Trade Commission or the FTC, they break up monopolies. They try to um, issue uh, concerns when monopolies might be forming. And distribution problems, the rich become richer. Uh, people prefer government action to moving or changing careers. We talked a little bit about that. So we talk about unemployment. I'm going to want you guys to know unemployment, austerity policies, uh, liberalization policies, and rent seeking and some of the distribution problems that come out of it. Um, I give a little bit of a synopsis about Taiwan and some of the open market strategies that occur here in Washington. So I want you to take a look at NAFTA and the Glass-Steagall Act, which are pretty good um, illustrations of government policies that are trying to either stimulate the economy or in a sense maybe preventing um, ways that people can exploit the stock market and a little bit of extra stuff there so um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, focus on uh, Japan, Japan, Taiwan and Korea South Korea and some of their actions to um, you know, make policies. So look at that, and we'll get uh, a little bit more into something called neoliberalism right now. So neoliberalism is actually kind of a conservative approach that, you know, could be traced. Uh, you know, one of the good illustrations is Bill Clinton's presidency was a very neoliberal type uh, policies where we cut back regulations, privatize services, cut welfare lower taxes, and minimize government debt. Thatcher and Reagan were a symbol. The idea spread to the left as well. Like I mentioned, Clinton. Um, by the late 90s, major parties in developed countries shared neoliberal consensus. Uh, Japan liberali uh, liberalized the lease, and growth fell to almost zero, so they didn't grow their economy. And one of the major focuses of complaints here is that these strategies increase inequality. Now, Great Recession, um, one of the things that I, you know, we had in the mid-2000s was something called the Great Recession War, where uh, we had a high level of unemployment, but low levels of uninflation. I mean, inflation, uninflation, that's a good word. Low levels of inflation. Um, some of the circumstances that helped, uh, that, uh, helped spur this recession was our housing bubble burst during that time, right? So a lot of people were getting loans and they were buying houses and they were, um, uh, when it came up for them to buy or to per pay on their mortgage, um, some of them people, some of the people were unable to do so due to uh, some of the risky loans that were put in. I'll put up a video that illustrates this in a little bit better detail. But, you know, we, we saw the, the unregulated financial markets were blamed in the 90s. Uh, people took out higher mortgages and they can afford uh, interest rates were too low. A little bit more. I'm going to post a, a, uh, a video about this. So go ahead and take a look at, you know, kind of the, the, the Keynesian view where we have to have periods of slow growth and long-term infrastructures, uh, market cycles between boom and bust. Um, higher growth will bring the tax revenue needed to pay off debt and some of the things that come out of that. So um, that's what we're going to do 
for now. Um, take a look at the rest of the chapters here, especially in this table. And then we will discuss uh, any questions that you have about it. So let me know. Um, I'm going to post a video with regards to uh, the, the, the concepts of what happened during the Great Recession. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, if you have any questions, please let me know.